And I had a famous English teacher, a wonderful, he would have been a university vice chancellor or something, but like Bill, but he, or even a chancellor. But he, he was a Christian brother, so he could never get promoted. And he had about six degrees and he was called Brother Doc Campbell. Everyone called him Doc. And he was actually from Warwick. See, a lot of people think you have to come out of a big city to be someone, but he was from Warwick and he knew more about Latin. They used to get him to go out the uni and give talks on philosophy and Latin and uh, English. And he had, he had two degrees in science and he taught English. And I put my hand up one day and said, why do you teach English when you... And he said, I teach you boys English because if you don't pass English, you won't get to look through the paling fence at the university. And I always remember when I went out to, there was only one university then, U of Q, and when I went out there, I was really surprised they didn't have a paling fence. <laughs> <coughs> so Doc taught us and me lots of things. Well, I remember when I was down near the bottom of the class, and so was my mate Jim, a Russian, Jim Egorov, because Russian was his first language, not English. I didn't have an excuse, he did. And Doc said, always remember boys, there is no disgrace in being even the least when all are great. And it's a very true thing. And when I was being shot and bombed and, uh, and lied to in Vietnam, I consoled myself with another thing Doc often used to say, to be brave is not to be without fear, but to overcome it. So you learn a lot of things. But the best thing Doc taught us was he taught us a lot about poetry and he said, you're going to find as you get older that poetry is the source and finer expression of all knowledge. And, you know, it, so sex, well, you weren't allowed to talk about sex in the 50s or the 60s, really. And so when they wanted to teach us about sex, they resorted to poetry because the Christian brothers didn't know anything about girls, or if they knew, they weren't going to tell us. So, so they taught us poems like this. So Galahad said, My good sword carves the casks of men. My lance, it thrust us sure. My strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. And they also told us, Look not upon a maiden, lest her beauty be a stumbling block to thee. And they used to teach us sex is all in the mind. And Kenny Fletcher said, yeah, but the trouble is I can't get my hand on my mind. <laughs> so in 1959, in grade 12, I ran into one of these stumbling blocks, a gorgeous redhead from St. Margaret's. And I was glad of all the poetry Doc taught us then because it was the one place that could capture her the way I saw her, you know, fashioned so purely fragilely, surely, from what paradisal, imagineless metal, too costly for cost, who hammered you, wrought you from Argentine vapour. That's how I saw her. And when she gave me up, I had Browning's poem. <laughs> had I done that, had I done this, so might I gain, so might I miss. Might she have loved me just as well, she might have hated, who can tell? Where had I been now? if the worst befell. So, w because of Doc, the one thing I took to the Vietnam w War with me was my blue poetry book, which we studied in English one, Seven Centuries of Poetry. And I noted what Browning said about war. A flag stuck on a heap of bones, a soldier's doing, what are tones? They scratch his name on the abbey stones. And when my roommate in Vietnam, in Saigon, Bruce Pickett, aged 23, he was from Melbourne, got killed in 1968. And the Vietnamese girl he was going to marry, Miss Na, was grief stricken. And it took a poet to sum up what was happening. And it was a Vietnamese poet, because they have famous poets too, Nguyen Du. And he wrote, one watches things that make one sick at heart. This is the law, no gain without a loss. And heaven hurts fair woman for sheer spite. So he also knew what went wrong with my brilliant tennis playing mate, Kenny Fletcher. Harry Hopman, the Australian coach, Fletch won five Wimbledon titles and played in the Davis Cup with Labor and Emerson. And, 
and he, Hopman said he had the best forehand in the world. But Fletch lost his way when we went to live in Hong Kong in 1964 and we started going to nightclubs every night. And I said to Fletch, gosh, Doc had a bit of poetry for the lifestyle we're living. Potatoes when I'm hungry, whiskey when I'm dry, Peggy when I'm lonely, heaven when I die. But Nguyen Du, Nguyen du said of people like Fletch, and you'll meet plenty, plenty of people like Fletch in your life, so it's worthwhile knowing. He said, in great talent, take no overweening pride. Great talent and misfortune make a pair. And I think it's pretty true. And so anyway, I came back to Australia. And I worked for Rupert Murdoch. So I thought the last thing I'd tell you something about him. Um, he has an annual report that looked for New the News Corporation Limited, TNCL, which is the biggest media company in the world. Looks like Vogue magazine. And it was written in New York in 1987 and they didn't, they didn't get it right. And so Rupert wanted it rewritten and no one in Sydney was game to do it. So they looked for someone expendable and took me down from Queensland to do it. And I even had to write Rupert's own chief executive's review for him. And the people, because of that, people now ask me, what do you think of the phone hacking scandal in Britain? where by using two mobile phones at once, reporters could hack anyone's phone messages, including even a murdered 13-year-old girl. And then I recall what Doc taught us that was written more than 300 years ago by Alexander Pope about such behaviour, uh, because it's just as true today. But when to mischief mortals bend their will how soon they find fit instruments of ill. 